I know as attorney for Lyndon Johnson that he murdered John Kennedy. He murdered John Kennedy to become president and to avoid prison, and there is no doubt in my mind Lyndon Baines Johnson. Born in 1908, he grew up in a comfortable middle-class home in Johnson City. At an early age, Lyndon showed a keen interest in politics. From the beginning, he was driven by a determination to win, whatever the cost. In a word, he was ruthless. There wasn't anything he wouldn't do to get what he wanted, regardless of what it was. And probably the best example would be in 1948 when he was running for the Senate and he was running against a man named Coke Stevenson and the election was very very close a very small number of votes which forced a, a recount and once they did the recount they found out a 201 vote error in a little place called Alice Texas and eventually they found out that the 201 votes had been added one for Stevenson 200 for LBJ as a result he won by 87 votes and he was nicknamed Landslide Linden but the real name, the name used in the back wards that didn't appear in the newspapers, was Lion Linden. And that stuck with him the rest of his life. That rigged ballot became the template for a political career based on bribery and corruption. The full extent of Johnson's criminal activity only began to unravel 11 years after his death. In 1984, at this courthouse in Franklin, Texas, a former Johnson business associate Billy Celestes appeared before a grand jury. According to Billy Celestes, there were eight murders perpetrated on the part of Lyndon Johnson. The first name was a man named Douglas Kenza. That was followed by a number of men involved in Estes' businesses who were corrupt. And they were all killed with carbon monoxide. Josepha Johnson's name is listed on this Justice Department document. That's Lyndon Johnson's sister. So Estes is accusing the Vice President of the United States of murdering his own sister. And the eighth name listed is the President of the United States, John F. Kennedy. And then there is a promise of knowing more. And if Billy Saul Estes is telling the truth, and there is every reason to believe he is, it gives you an idea of the depth of the corruption and the ruthlessness of Lyndon Johnson. After becoming a senator in 1948, Johnson developed an unrivaled power base in Washington using his forceful personality, political skills, and corruption. He established himself as one of the most influential men in the nation, but as vice president to Kennedy, he lost much of that authority. By 1961, his past was catching up with him. In Texas, Henry Marshall, a local agricultural official, had begun investigating one of Johnson's illegal sources of funding. Working out of these offices in Bryan, Texas, Marshall had become aware of Billy Solesti's misappropriation of federal cotton allotment funds. Attempts to buy off Marshall had failed, and his investigations were beginning to threaten the vice president himself. Billy Solesti's became worried. Lyndon Johnson became worried and some of them got together and decided what are we going to do with Henry Marshall. So on one particular day, according to Billy Celestes, Billy Celestes, Cliff Carter, an aide to Lyndon Johnson, Lyndon Johnson, the Vice President of the United States, and Malcolm Wallace got together. And finally Lyndon made the statement, get rid of him. On June the 3rd, 1961, Henry Marshall failed to return home. An extensive search was made of the family farm near Franklin, Texas. His only son, Don, was 11 years old at the time and remembers that day well. My uncle found him on the second attempt uh, when he, he went out uh, to the place. He was uh, in a very remote location, probably about three quarters of a mile off the road. My mother had this stone placed here uh, in order to, to mark the spot. The truck had blood around the sides of it. Uh, the uh, side on the, on the passenger side had a dent in the fender behind the passenger door, and that's apparently where my father's head was uh, knocked into the side of the truck, and uh, he had his eye damaged at that point. Uh, there were a number of yopon bushes that had been broken, and, and the gun was laying beside the body, and pretty much nothing else uh, could be seen except signs of a struggle. Local officials immediately ruled it a suicide, 
despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary. He had been shot five times with a bolt action rifle. He had enough carbon monoxide in his lungs to cause him to pass out at the time he died. Uh, there was no effort made to collect any evidence or preserve the, the crime scene. They had pretty much determined in their minds that this was going to be a suicide. When Billy Saul Estes testified before the grand jury in Franklin, uh, he implicated Cliff Carter and Malcolm Wallace as the people that were most involved in my father's murder. Uh, Wallace being the trigger man and Cliff Carter uh, being the one who arranged for the uh, murder. I'm firmly convinced that uh, Malcolm Wallace uh, uh, was the, the killer of my father. Who that would have aided, uh, probably uh, political power behind everything, Johnson would have been aided more than anyone else. The grand jury concluded Henry Marshall in 1961 was murdered which means in simple language that the grand jury believed Billy Saul Estes when he told them that Lyndon Johnson had ordered Malcolm Wallace to kill Henry Marshall. But Johnson's dark dealings were not confined to Texas. In late summer 1963, one of his long-term partners in crime was about to be exposed for corruption by a Senate investigation. Bobby Baker was the secretary to the Senate majority. Basically, he was the secretary for the Senate. And he was one of Lyndon Johnson's closest associates. And everything that Lyndon Johnson wanted to perpetrate, he had Bobby's help. Essentially, if somebody wanted to get a military contract and they wanted influence of Lyndon Johnson to help them, they had to pay off Bobby Baker, who would then pay off Lyndon Johnson. It's the world of bribes. Bobby Baker was involved in a call girl service, he was involved in real estate schemes, he was involved in dealings with organized crime, he was in dealings with oil men, particularly Clint Murkison, an oil millionaire from Texas. So as a result of all this, Bobby Baker was in big trouble. And uh, with a little bit of inspiration on the part of the Kennedys that they could get Bobby Baker to talk, Lyndon was all done. Lyndon Baines Johnson if Robert Kennedy had his way, would not only not be on the 1964 ticket as the vice presidential candidate, but he would go to jail for the corruption that he was involved with. Although Johnson faced political extinction at the hands of the Kennedys, he had powerful allies with their own agendas that threatened the president, as researcher Gregory Burnham explains. People would think that he had no enemies. He was so popular. He smiled. He appeared happy. Everyone loved him worldwide. But what people don't seem to understand is behind the scenes, he was making changes. And he was making them decisively. And he was taking some very, very daring steps. He was committed to pull out of Vietnam. By October, he had signed a document, an SAM 263, to that effect. A thousand troops home by Christmas, and all personnel out of Vietnam by 1965. But that wasn't very good for the military industrial complex. His abolishing the Central Intelligence Agency, pulling their teeth, holding them to task, back to why they were originally created by Truman. Their original mandate by law is only to coordinate intelligence, not to create the Bay of Pigs. NSAM 55 told the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff that the CIA no longer can do that. And any military operation has to come directly from them to the president, period. That kind of a document really causes problems 